what is the difference between a, uh, an industrial hemp plant and a marijuana plant? And so the, the questions that come into play there, basically there's a federal standard as, as the industrial hemp has been removed from a certain class uh, or controlled substances, what we're left with is the, the federal definition is that it is basically marijuana and industrial hemp, they're all cannabis sativa, or pretty much all cannabis sativa, that's the Latin name. And then the specific plants that we are considering as industrial hemp are plants that by definition have uh, 0.3 tenths of 1% or less of THC, that's the narcotic component. Uh, it is possible that plants uh, on the approved list that we hear about, say in Colorado or Kansas, could go, uh, what the industry says is they could turn hot. That is, they might develop a higher level of THC if they are tested and they go above three-tenths of a percent of THC, then the federal regulations will require that that field be destroyed. Uh, there are several people, Patrick, that have asked, is, is there any uh, escape clause, is there any exemption that you could possibly get so that a farmer wouldn't incur that, uh, that loss of a crop after all the expense? And so far the answer has been no. There are no provisions in any state rules because at a minimum they have to follow that federal standard. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the definition for what will be considered marijuana versus hemp is 0.3 percent THC or less and then it would be classified as uh, industrial hemp. Again, above 0.3 percent, then it would be required to be destroyed. And so uh, as we await, you know, common question right now from a lot of folks here in Texas is, uh, currently being October, when will we have rules to, that would release us for uh, applications and licensing and so forth for production in Texas in 2020? And, and that is still up in the air. Uh, we anticipated that USDA would release their rules uh, as guidance under the 2018 Farm Bill, and, but that hasn't happened yet. And so really, I think in Texas, until USDA releases their rules, we are up in the air a little bit about what the time frame will be for licensing. And so once USDA releases the rules, there probably will be a public comment period. Uh, that will give the states an opportunity to see the early indication of what those rules are and I think Texas will, will be ready. Uh, my understanding is that Texas Department of Ag understanding what, what is expected for rules will probably be pretty close to, to ready to file uh, a Texas plan with USDA which must then be approved. And so from that point, once we have approval from USDA, then Texas Department of Ag will be tasked with getting the whole process set up for applications, for review of applications. Uh, there will be background checks uh, for anyone that applies for a license. Uh, if you've had uh, certain types of misdemeanor, it's either misdemeanor or, or felony drug convictions in the last 10 years, you're not eligible for a license. Uh, the other thing that will have to be set up, like you have here in New Mexico, is there will be a, a defined testing procedure set up because uh, what we see in most states is that at some point, a certain number of days before you anticipate harvest, you'll have to notify your state Department of Agriculture and then they come test your field. They collect samples and, and Patrick, this, this is, a, uh, this is a, an area of confusion perhaps in that, well, what part of this plant would you test for CBD? Do you just, I'm sorry, for THC, what part of the plant do you test for that component which we could lead to crop destruction? Do you, do you test just some of the floral structures like you have here? Or uh, do you po possibly take a larger portion of the plant depending on what the use may be? Uh, there are some harvest processors uh, processing mechanically may take potentially the whole plant. And so as you include more stems and leaves and so forth, then you would naturally probably be pulling that THC down. So that's an important consideration when Texas Department of Ag sets the rules, what part of that plant is going to be tested? Within Texas, uh, uh, when will license become available and how will that relate to planning dates? And as we've learned in, in Southeast Colorado, uh, in here in New Mexico, that uh, the lack of vigor in a lot of these planting varieties could be uh, something that lends us to avoid hot conditions. Uh, uh, Dr. Curtis Bench is at Oklahoma Panhandle State University. He is 
uh, been one of the people that has helped me as much in terms of learning about industrial hemp. He's made uh, trips to southeast Colorado where some of his former students at OPSU are farming hemp. And so as in his third year of watching this crop and, and it's commented that you will see hemp seedlings emerging in southeast Colorado in March when it's still pretty cold. Uh, and so I think that speaks to what we're learning is that we have the possibility of planting this crop earlier. If you're in the Texas High Plains, uh, that could be certainly in April. Uh, I would say maybe even, even March would possibly be a consideration. Let's talk a little bit about uh, industrial hemp, uh, you know, the uses. First of all, you have the CBD. Within industrial hemp, you have a family of chemicals called cannabinoids. There are over a hundred. Uh, CBD is one of them. Uh, THC is another. There are other CB uh, cannabinoids that we're starting to hear about that also may have value as CBG, CBN. Uh, I don't know that there's any market for those yet, but they're starting to draw some attention in terms of how they might be also uh, useful materials if there are plants that produce those in quantity. Uh, a common misconception, and I've made this mistake myself, <clears throat> CBD itself is not an oil. <clears throat> it's one of the cannabinoids. It can be extracted from the plants. Uh, there's some chemical processes that do this. And you can actually reduce the CBD into a crystalline granular type material, kind of powder-like. Why we call it CBD oil is because that powder material is then reconstituted in a carrier like coconut oil or something like that. And so that's where you get CBD oil. This would be in contrast to the seed of industrial hemp, which does produce an oil that can be crushed like sunflower oil or, or cottonseed oil. I have seen uh, hemp seed oil in grocery stores uh, in Lubbock, in one of our specialty food grocery stores. So that, that's the CBD. Uh, there are uh, medical uh, defined and prescribed medical uses for CBD, for some cases epilepsy. Uh, there are some others that are being looked at, but a lot of the, a lot of the uh, claims that you hear about CBD are, are, are I, would say I would say, not unfounded, but they're not with, they're without the scientific research to show if indeed this is something that's having an effect. And I, I recently read a, a, it was a media report, but it cited some research from a University of Pennsylvania researcher. Uh, 2017 and his research showed that in the range of about 20 or 20 percent of the CBD products that were tested uh, had uh, less CBD than what was on the label in fact they even found traces of THC in some of the samples and so that that's another need where there needs to be uh, some quality control but right now as you mentioned there's no regulation from the federal or state level that dictates that that has to be a, a, like a guaranteed analysis that has a minimum number of, I mean, if you buy Tylenol, you're, you pretty much know that you're getting 500 milligrams of acetaminophen in that tablet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because it's, it's, it's being checked, it's tested, and uh, that type of thing is not being done uniformly for CBD. Sound advice is, you know, anytime when we're thinking about our health and so forth, uh, we, we have to, you know, we are, we, in our medical profession in the U.S., we are essentially a data-driven, uh, a, a, a society of data-driven medicine. There's been research that supports the use of drugs, the practices, the type of surgery that they do. Uh, if you have a family practitioner, your, your family doctor, your personal physician uh, that you go to see, ask them about CBD. Uh, hemp also has uses for grain. Uh, in North Dakota, uh, which I think is in their either their fourth or fifth year of hemp production, uh, there is one grain elevator in North Dakota that accepts hemp grain. Uh, hemp, hemp seed, hemp grain uh, is, has a very uh, favorable nu nutritional profile. Uh, I think I would equate it, Patrick, uh, from what I've learned probably to amaranth. Uh, they might have similar attributes of amaranth. It has that type of nutritional profile which has some, some advantages. The fiber question is, is something that uh, we've had folks here in the Texas High Plains ask, well is hemp going to replace all of our cotton? Not at all. Uh, it could be a, a rotation crop that some producers will seek to use. Uh, 
the, the fiber processing does not have the high inflated values about profits per acre. We really don't have a good feel for that because only in Kentucky and maybe North Carolina is there really any commercial uh, hemp production so far for fiber. When we work for an agency whose mandate is to bring uh, research-based information to our clientele, it's like, oh my goodness, how are we going to do this? And, and uh, I think in one way, this, this is where I feel fortunate that I've had a lot of experience with other crops in Texas where we don't have very much crop information. And within limits, I'm willing to step out on the limb to help producers think through production questions when we don't have research. We're certainly going to deal with this with, hemp, with industrial hemp. We will rely on information that we learn from other states. Uh, when I visit with uh, producers here in New Mexico and Colorado, I have a bazillion questions. When did you plant? What did you see? What did you learn? How did you harvest? What insects did you notice? Uh, uh, if you had a field, uh, you know, what happens if you're in the Texas High Plains in 2020 and you have a field that gets drifted on by dicamba from dicamba tolerant cotton that's uh, maybe a mile or two away? What's that going to do to him? We don't know. Uh, we have some ideas uh, of what the answers might be for some of these questions, but uh, likewise in Texas, we don't have a single individual that has had experience with industrial hemp in the background. So here's a, here's a question that some people might have. We, we hear about industrial hemp that it's going to require a license in order to grow the crop. And I might add that if you, if you uh, grow or even possess any plant parts of these plants in Texas and you do not have a license, then you would be in violation of the law. If you are going to have, even if it's industrial hemp and you do not have a license, then you would be in violation. And so basically you could say if you don't have a license, then this might as well be a marijuana plant in terms of what the law says. So licensing for other crops, uh, uh, to my knowledge, there are no other crops in Texas that require licenses. There will be crops where you will have a relationship between the producer and the, and the buyer of that crop that involves a contract. And, and this would be a very different situation. Uh, crops in Texas that could be contracted, for example, could be uh, sunflowers, uh, winter canola. Uh, we used to have some safflower that was under contract. Uh, you might have uh, some organic crops that are contracted. A lot of our pea and bean crops, the black-eyed peas, those are usually contracted crops, the purpose there probably is as much about controlling or limiting the production so that the contractor can go into the market with a price that, the produ that is good for the producer and, and not, uh, not run into the, the risk of oversupply. Contracts will uh, kind of control that potential oversupply. If, for example, if you were a sunflower grower in the Texas High Plains and you did not have a contract, you have oilseed sunflower, then you would be at the, at the uh, I wouldn't say at the mercy, but you would be uh, subject to whether there was a buyer that was willing to pay you a price that you felt good about for that crop because you did not have a contract. And I think we will see with industrial hemp uh, just things that producers will de deal with is uh, I think that no producer in Texas should consider planting hemp unless they have identified and received a commitment from a buyer. Uh, we think that contracts uh, will be one uh, means to clarify any issues that might be questions that could be raised between a buyer and a, and a grower. Uh, those contracts are going to be much more detailed than what a sunflower grower would have with a confectionery sunflower processor in Lubbock. Uh, it's a probably a one-page contract. Uh, price, uh, what to do if you lose your crop due to hail, uh, there, whether or not you have to deliver a certain number of pounds or whether it's just an acre-based contract, uh, the grading parameters, so what's the size of that sunflower seed. So with a contract on industrial hemp, you're going to have a lot more terms and conditions that probably related to the value of the crop and the quality of that crop that you know, will need to be defined. and. Uh, we think early on that, that this is something that probably producers probably ought to have their own attorney look over these contracts uh, before they do that. If, if a producer is, is talking to a prospective buyer and that buyer were to say, oh, we've never had to do contracts like that before, that's not necessary, that might be a yellow flag. 
that uh, you're, you're talking about a situation where you may not have the protection that you need. And so uh, as far as farmers in New Mexico, Patrick, uh, have you heard anything about the types of, of buying arrangements that they've had with, with purchasers? I have not as of yet. I, I don't know. Uh, that's one of the things that, uh, as I did my own research and just reading on and studying, and, and when you hear the information come out of the states that have been growing hemp for, for some time, they, they came in on the 2014 bill, Okay. Uh, Kentucky or, or North Dakota. <coughs> And all the stories that I've read from the producers they visited with there, those guys all talk about making sure that you've got a place to go with this stuff. Make sure you've yes. got a contract line locked in and that you have a home for this product okay. and that you don't get left hanging with it. And so I've been real curious as to uh, what folks are doing, uh, where they're going to have to go to get it processed, uh -huh. uh, where they're going to have to haul it to. Uh, you know, the question was even raised in, 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 as this comes along, okay, it's legal in New Mexico. You can transport it with your license. You can transport it and do what uh -huh. you need to do in the state to conduct your business. But if you cross state lines with that product and that state uh -huh. does not have a hemp policy, you are now essentially carrying contraband. Yeah, potentially so, subject to another state's exactly, view in, in terms exactly, of legality. And exactly. Within the 2018 farm bill there was language in there and I have read it to, and I myself would grant that that it sounds like it reads as if hemp would be eligible for federal program crop insurance and I think those terms mean, mean a higher level of backing contrast to some crops that have crop insurance but are not program crops so uh, I think in turn we'll learn exactly what that is what I have read recently here as of early October 2019 is that the whole farm revenue protection crop insurance, uh, uh, I guess that would be a form of crop insurance, uh, is apparently expected to be available in 2020. Uh, I've seen some other language that suggests that that is only applies to a hemp that's grown under the auspices of the 2014 farm bill. And uh, that didn't seem right to me, but it's a question that popped up. Uh, and the 2014 Farm Bill, just to clarify, that's why we have hemp here in New Mexico, uh, in Oklahoma, in Colorado, and Kentucky, because the, the 2014 Farm Bill authorized educational institutions within each state to set up a pilot research hemp program, and then farmers under the auspices of that research program could be approved uh, to grow industrial hemp. So that's why we have hemp in other states. Texas did not choose to do anything under the 2014 Farm Bill. So if it seems like we're behind a little bit, we are, because uh, we're a little bit late to the game here. The, the thing on the crop insurance, uh, it's very clear in the guidelines on, on what would be federal or program crop insurance. If the crop has to be destroyed because of too high THC levels, that is not an insurable loss. And that even even raises the question of, of the, are you going to find that lending agencies like your federal land bank, uh, your regional banks, uh, and so forth, are, are they going to be willing to loan money on industrial hemp? And I think you will find that they're going to put uh, a, a much higher level of scrutiny on loan applications if a producer is uh, interested. There's some banks that have said we, we've, we're uncomfortable with loaning money on hemp because we're not completely comfortable with the, the clearance that industrial hemp has been given at the federal level in terms of not being regulated as a drug and so forth. Uh, I understand that credit unions uh, through their national administration, uh, credit unions that are federally chartered, chartered have been uh, uh, instructed that they are okay to pursue or consider uh, loan opportunities for industrial hemp. But uh, if you don't have crop insurance, then there are some institutions I think will simply say, we're not going to loan money. So one, one of the research questions that we will have in Texas A&M AgriLife once we have the opportunity is, what, what is the effect of of planting date on, on potential THC spikes? So what, what is the uh, what varieties in Texas conditions may look like they could be borderline with THC? What, what are things like, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, the, the things that we have interest in research-wise, uh, not just THC, but whether it's CBD or whether it's fiber or possibly grain, what's the effect of planting date on grain yield or fiber quality and quantity or CBD 
yield within the plants. What's the, the effect of the timing of nitrogen applications on a crop? What about irrigation timing? And uh, those are things we don't know. We have some ideas about what may be appropriate management. Uh, we, and we can look to, especially I think for producers in the High Plains because of the several years of experience in Colorado, uh, I think a lot of the Colorado information off the, in eastern Colorado will be relatively applicable in the Texas High Plains. But if you're a, if you're a, a prospective producer in the Blacklands of Central Texas, Northeast Texas, the lower Rio Grande Valley, the coastal bend, uh, those, the, that's hundreds of miles from where my office is. And production conditions are going to be very different. So I think there may be a, a lot of uh, uh, two steps forward, one step back as, as we learn about this crop. What is, the, what is the impact of hail on industrial hemp? Texas High Plains producers or, or, or any cotton producers anywhere in Texas know how fragile seedling cotton is to hail. What about industrial hemp? Uh, if you have a plant like grain sorghum or corn that gets hailed on, you got a different type of plant. It doesn't have a terminal in the top of that plant that if it's lost, then the plant will never produce. Uh, so that's part of my interest in learning how does this plant grow and to see whether it might be uh, uh, vulnerable to hail. We heard here on this field, Patrick, that wind damage to sand, blowing sand was enough to to, what was the word that the producer used? It basically kind of mowed the crop off. Yeah. And uh, so. Well, some other simple questions, uh, just general productivity. Uh, what, what does hemp do? What, what soil types does it respond best to? Mm -hmm. What fertility? I've you heard know, sandy. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, you, you hear lots of things about fertility wise, but it really, from what I'm gathering, really needs more fertility than what is being pitched that, oh, you can just kind of toss it out there and let it go. Yeah. I, it yeah. really leans itself more towards a cultivated <coughs> crop that requires some fertility to perform and, uh, well. One of the, uh, that's a question I've had from several people and, and I exchanged some emails with Dr. Tony Proven. He is the director of the Texas A&M Soil Test Lab in College Station. And I asked Tony, what will we, what will we do what will you do in College Station at our soil test lab when you receive soil samples and they say they're growing industrial hemp? And I believe Tony said that right now, because there's no soil test information really in any state in the U.S., so we kind of have to think, is there a crop that, that maybe this would be uh, similar to in terms of growth and nutrient requirement? Uh, Tony's answer in part was that he thinks the fertility requirements of, a, of a, a good producing industrial hemp crop might be in the range of about 150 bushel an acre corn crop. And uh, he cited some North Carolina information in that regard. So there, there's nothing, uh, there, 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 there's no chemicals approved for any use in hemp. And so, you know, we, Eastern New Mexico, uh, because of our, our uh, rich tradition here in peanuts have fought uh, lots of different foliar diseases and, yeah. and soil diseases. Leaf, leaf spot, uh, rhizoctonia, a pithy, pythium. Yeah. Pythium. And so, you know, I've wondered, are, are, and it may not be, it may be a, a mute issue, but if there are, are there diseases that are going to affect mm -hmm. them, how do you deal with them? Well, and a big question for Texas producers would be, what about cotton root rot? And uh, cotton, nematodes. cotton root rot, nematodes is another one, and we've got different kinds of nematodes. Uh, cotton root rot is mostly uh, is mostly ab is pretty much absent in the Texas High Plains uh, uh, north of I-20 and, and up on the Caprock. But as we move into the rest of the state, we're going to see uh, there's going to be some exposure to cotton root rot. And I I think about the types of plants that, that cotton root rot, whether they're weeds or whether they're crops that affect. I would think Patrick that industrial hemp appears to be the kind of plant that cotton root rot probably could be active on. So until we grow in some of those areas, uh, we won't know. Uh, in, in the first year or two, we might be okay, but then it might, it might be different in, in a field. Uh, I have wondered about this myself. Uh, if you're a Texas high plains grower, or in, in much of our Texas cropping, because we have in the range of about five or six million acres of cotton, industrial hemp as a rotation crop for cotton. Uh, we know that crop rotation is good, but I, I think I see some similarities in a hemp plant versus a cotton plant that makes me think that there could be some, some un yet unknown overlap, but potential significant overlap of pathogens that we see in cotton that could be active in hemp because 
similar, somewhat similar types of plants in contrast to uh, the difference you see from cotton versus grain sorghum or corn or wheat. You have a, in those grasses you have a very different type of, of uh, pest. But currently in the U.S. there are no approved crop protection uh, products for insecticides, herbicides, or fungicides for use on industrial hemp. There are some applications at EPA that deal with uh, organic materials, but I don't think for general production they're probably going to have uh, that much value unless there's something that we specifically know of that really does work well. Uh, there might be some research on a few of those materials on other organic crops, but uh, you know herbicides. Uh, uh, you know, questions for herbicides are not just what can I, what could I, what herbicide could I use? Obviously with a plant like that you could use an over-the-top grass herbicide because this is not a grass, you might have grasses, broad leaves, a different issue. What about planting industrial hemp in a field that had herbicides from cotton production last year where you have carryover residual? Yeah. Uh, our weed scientists within A&M system, uh, that would be, uh, those individuals are based at Corpus Christi College Station in Lubbock. Uh, those are the individuals that we would engage to try to help think through and answer that question in terms of whether there's a, a potential carryover residual herbicide that could be a problem for industrial hemp. What Patrick mentioned about lack of vigor, uh, other producers I know uh, here in New Mexico have commented that they had healthy looking plants and for no apparent reason they might die when they're 12 inches tall. I think the varieties that are used for CBD, uh, and CBD would be the cannabinoid material that you hear a lot about uh, that's being used uh, as a health aid, uh, a suppository, something that you might take internally. The varieties that are used for CBD production really are not that far removed from marijuana in their background and so those plants tend to be uh, varieties that that are used to a very pampered environment where they were grown. They were never in a hot dry environment. They were grown in a cool forested area. They might have been grown under controlled conditions in a greenhouse and so the process of selecting varieties uh, was in a legal sense where they were screening for things that they thought were better marijuana plants probably did not select for plants that had any fight or vigor when they would be brought into field conditions. What I have heard from others in other states is that the varieties that a farmer here in New Mexico or in Texas soon or in Colorado, Oklahoma might plant that would be for grain or for fiber production tend to be uh, varieties that had a little bit more selection uh, or effort put into breeding and selection in their past. And so those varieties uh, tend to be lower in THC. There's not the concern about those turning hot. Uh, and so I think when we get to seeing uh, fields in New Mexico and Texas, the Southern Great Plains that are planted possibly for grain, but especially for fiber, I think some of the issues that we're seeing in fields planted for CBD are probably going to uh, be reduced quite a bit because we'll have better quality seed. One question has been in Texas, early on <coughs> some of my colleagues asked the question if maybe hemp could be grown with just one half the water of cotton, as little as one half of the water of cotton. We don't think that's probably a realistic because uh, first of all if you're in a CBD, the amount of money that you spent on that crop I think you would be very reluctant to allow it to go dry land. I could see the possibility for fiber production on dry land <coughs> in areas of the state of Texas where rainfall might be in the 20 inch range or a little bit less. But I think as far as CBD, when you look at the amount of expense involved, I don't think any farmer is going to be willing to hold back on irrigation. So I really would say, based on what I've learned so far, anticipate that if you're in an irrigated situation, you would water hemp probably in the range of what you would water your cotton. You may find that economically you should water it at a higher level. Uh, so we're in a drying shed that's just a regular machine shed that's been uh, is being used for drying of industrial hemp for CBD and just as I was walking I heard crunching underfoot and so the plants that we were in the field earlier here in eastern New Mexico uh, there is seed in that sample it was crunching underfoot so you can see this is the kind of seed development uh, this particular producer had a lot of male plants in the field and tried to remove them as much as they could, but they still had a lot of pollination and so that's why we have the grain. So 
uh, in theory, if, if you want high percent CBD yield, you'd like to avoid the situation where you have any grain development at all. But in this case, uh, there is some. So I think uh, production-wise, th this producer will be interested in knowing what CBD levels he has in the material that you see behind me here. And uh, if they can come up with a modest CD CBD percentage, uh, maybe in the range of 6% or higher, then that, uh, depending on the processor, that would be uh, acceptable material, especially if it can be produced at a fraction of the cost of what your very high percent CBD that might run, say, 12% or more. So something that uh, farmers across Texas are going to have to think through in terms of processing with fiber, uh, especially for CBD, is there's a need to get the plant biomass dried down so that we don't have rotting and molding. And so this is just one approach here. This is a, a hand harvest operation. Again, think about the labor that's involved, especially if they'd had a lot more plants per acre than what we saw earlier today. But uh, these plants here have been hung up. They were chopped off at ground level, and so we've got a, a wire that's built through here. And there's, you can see there's, there's a lot of moisture here. There's a lot of weight on that wire. And uh, so you have the open area on the south end, but uh, the producer probably will put some kind of fans on here to help move through the air. Uh, he's commented that it's very humid in here uh, during the day. And so this drying process is important. Uh, but if you're in a situation where you have uh, even uh, several hundred acres, then this type of situation for one producer would not be feasible. There's just not enough labor. There's not enough capacity to dry this much material. So when we, as we learn more about what farmers with large acreages are doing that have mechanical harvests, then we'll have to see uh, what the, the approaches are, what the strategies are to get that material uh, dried down. But uh, mechanical harvest is not going to bring in, I don't think, nearly as, as much biomass. But again, across Texas, uh, humid central and east Texas versus the, the dry area in the high plains, the drying issue is going to be far more important in, in more humid areas of the state, uh, but still will be an important consideration even if you're in far west Texas or in the Texas high plains. The thing that I would like to mention is right now in Texas we, we have a lot of people that are uh, you know, promoting themselves as being in the hemp industry, uh, offering deals, uh, people claiming that they've got a number of producers signed up or they have commitments of acreage. I don't really think anybody's that far. And uh, as we hear about some of these things, I think it's going to be an incumbent upon growers and producers to really vet the people they're talking to about industrial hemp. Uh, what kind of facilities, what kind of track record do they have? Can you talk to previous growers for that company? Uh, of course, that would be in other states. But uh, Texas A&M, uh, there have been individuals in the state have claimed that they're working with Texas A&M. And uh, phone calls and emails and so forth do not constitute working with Texas A&M. Uh, A&M does have uh, some interest from some individual groups where there's some discussions about uh, helping them explore the possibilities in Texas for hemp production, whether it's for CBD or for fiber. But as far as any kind of a research agreement or anything like that, uh, those would not be the kind of people, the kind of groups so far that would be, uh, as of um, early October, those are not the kind of folks that are out talking to producers yet. They're working more on the business side of their development and exploring ideas, which uh, with Texas A&M, we're having the opportunity to make suggestions in terms of what kinds of research we think would be viable. So I and several colleagues ha have been working on producing materials for uh, Texas producers. Uh, a lot of those are the kind of questions that we have that we think producers need to think about. Uh, there's summaries of some of our conversations and a lot of that information is now being gathered at a website. Just type in Texas A&M Hemp and you should find the A&M AgriLife resources on that. But uh, again, uh, just as we have the opportunity in Texas, uh, uh, we, we can't overemphasize that we need to be cautious. Uh, their prices and craziness that we hear about, uh, people get overexcited about the, some of these profit potential. Uh, if, if you are a producer that's in dire financial straits right now, I, would, I really think that you need to stay away from hemp. This is not something that's going to save the farm. Uh, I suppose in theory that's possible, 
but uh, there's concerns about the high level of risk uh, because of, of THC development, because of planting seed. Uh, uh, this is just something that producers are going to have to be very careful as they start. And uh, if you feel, at, if you ever feel like you're pressed to make a decision right now, like this is the opportunity, or we have some seed, it's for sale, but the price goes up tomorrow, or we're about out of seed, or a contractor says this is a price right now, you need to sign today, just walk away. Th those are things that are not in your favor, that, that approach, those are not in your best interest as far as a producer and setting yourself up and eliminating some of the possible pitfalls that you could run into.